This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Boker Tov, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Steve Cohen, for that uh, wonderful introduction to a community that I don't need an introduction to because I feel a part of this congregation and this community. Um, and it's my privilege to be here with Rabbi Steve Cohen, who I've known for over 30 years. And uh, I think I gave him one of his first jobs in Jewish life as a Hebrew school teacher at the Brooklyn Heights Synagogue, and uh, he was pretty good. He was, you know, not so easy in those late afternoons to make it come alive, but he could do that. And uh, of course, to Professor Richard Hecht, and to, I'll uh, say a few more words about Richard in a moment, and really to this Taubman Symposium, and frankly, to this uh, entire community coming together. So I wanted to start, if I could, with a moment of personal narrative, which I think is not personal, I think it's generational. I want to go back to, to 1974. And I was a uh, sophomore at UCSB. By the way, when you tell people outside of Santa Barbara that you went to UCSB, <laughs> they assume that you study the history of surf. <laughs> or that you were part of, you know, basically an ongoing love in an Isla Vista, that you actually, that you actually went to classes, uh, wrote papers, is completely unknown to those folks. So by the way, I'm your ambassador when I'm out on the road, <laughs> and they say, yo, we went to UCSB. They say, oh, right, how come we didn't go to college? Um, <laughs> so I'm working hard, and hopefully you'll be beneficiaries of some of that uh, correcting of the record. So I'm a sophomore. 1974, and uh, my mom calls me up in uh, the beginning of September. She says, uh, Rick, are you coming home for Yom Kippur? I thought to myself, well, there are things I could do here. I could go home. And I thought to myself, how, how much does this matter? And I realized I had been at Camp Swig for a number of years and kind of had a, a sense of Jewishness, but I, I thought to myself, I'm not really sure how important this Yom Kippur is. I know how important my family is, but I, so I thought to myself, you know what? I actually don't know enough to know if it's really important. So I said to myself, I'm going to learn about the Jewish tradition in a serious way, and if it matters, it's going to matter all the way. And if it doesn't matter, I'm just going to kind of take my my seat outside, because I don't want to be one of those people who kind of pretends that he's in, but he's not really in. So. I walked into class, and, and, and Professor Richard Heck was teaching. And uh, Richard just opened, opened the Jewish world, the Jewish world of learning, the Jewish world of deep questioning, and the seriousness that we need to bring to both our identities and our sense of what the Jewish tradition is all about. And, and it just kept growing, and I kept learning. I went to, uh, to Israel for my junior year abroad, never been to Israel and just got on the plane with the education abroad and said, okay, I have to figure out what Israel means as well. Spent the year studying with uh, Professor David Hartman, a uh, wonderful Orthodox teacher and uh, philosopher. And uh, he actually led me to become a very traditional practicing Jew. I went and lived on an Orthodox kibbutz and they wanted me to stay uh, because their basketball team was really... <laughs> I mean, if you've ever seen me play, you know how badly they must have uh, been without me because they, they, they said, could you please stay? And uh, I said, well, not at the moment. I have to go finish uh, my education. 
And it turns out that uh, coming back, I ended up coming to this congregation every Sunday morning. Do you know why I was here every Sunday morning? Because I taught the ninth grade at CBB, and I had the experience that some of you, if you're parents and grandparents, you know that experience on Sunday morning. I had the ninth graders, and they were, they were not happy campers. <laughs> They, they came in as if, you know, they were kind of dragged in. And then, of course, the principal then said, go make some magic. <laughs> 9.30, Sunday morning, group of teenagers, go make some magic. Easier said than done. And then here we are. So I tell you that story because if it was just me, it's not worth telling. There's a, there's a journey of discovery and connection that's alive. We have some UCSB students here. Put your hand up if you're a student at UCSB. All right. By, by the way, one of them may be the next president of the Union for Reform Judaism, <laughs> because I certainly could not have imagined that's where I would have gone. So to think of our own personal journeys of discovery and connection and taking hold of Torah in a deep way. Uh, very, very powerful. So let me tell you a story that comes to this past Yom Kippur. And the story is my, uh, my oldest, who's graduating from college next Sunday, uh, he said to me on the Sunday morning after Yom Kippur, you know, it was a, a Shabbat Yom Kippur this year. You remember that, right? So, so on Sunday morning, my, my oldest one, uh, Aaron, said, Abba, you look tired. I said, how long have you been my son? I <laughs> said, uh, 21 years. I said, well, it's the day after Yom Kippur. It's my last Yom Kippur as a pulpit rabbi, 30 years as a pulpit rabbi. And I said, I, I, I got why you're tired. So he said, we're going to go to the movies tonight. You're going to get your mind up all this. We'll just connect. I said, great. He said, but I'm not telling you what movie we're going to see. I said, great, but don't make it a late movie because I'm a little tired. I'll probably fall asleep. They'll turn off the lights. He said, it won't be. So uh, he, he sends me a text message. Do you have any kids, right? <laughs> don't tell me, don't call me, send me a text message. He said, we're going to an 11 o'clock show. I said, what, what part of not too late did you not understand? <laughs> I said, this is not going to work. So I said, oh, so I'll get a little schluff. I'll go sleep a little bit, it's fine. So we get to the movie theater and he hands me my ticket. We're going to see a movie called Moneyball. <laughs> did anybody see Moneyball? Okay. You, you don't have to love baseball, you don't have to love the Oakland A's, you just actually have to love this story. So I'm sitting there, and two minutes into it, it's about Billy Bean who reinvents baseball for the Oakland A's. And two minutes into it, I am clear that this is a movie about the reform movement. <laughs> I am wide awake because it's about the URJ. The people sitting next to me thought it was about baseball. And the scene that I'm going to lift up and then we're going to unpack and we're going to talk is a scene where Billy Bean goes into the uh, scouting room. A bunch of older guys with cigars and all sitting around going, all right, how are we going to get the next Jason Giambi? And Billy Bean says, you don't get it. It's not about finding the next superstar. We have to change the way we think about the game of baseball. And he says, this phrase, and it's been in my head ever since. He said, adapt or die. <coughs> adapt or die. Friends, I believe where we are in the history, not just of the reform movement, of Jewish life, it's a moment of adapt or die. It sounds, I know, a little bit dire, doesn't it? Adapt or die. Uh, it sounds like a rallying cry. It sounds like a shry of gewalt, you know, What's going to be? But I believe if we do not pay attention and adapt to all the remarkable seismic shifts in Jewish life today, then the, the future will not be bright. So I want us right now, I need seven different things that are going on in the wider world, the Jewish world and the wider culture, that are so powerful and so uh, kind of uh, deep in their shift of how we experience the world that we have to pay attention, understand, and adapt to these uh, change forces, these new realities of Jewish life. I need seven of them because seven is your, your perfect Jewish number. And I want to put you on the spot because I actually think that you'll generate the perfect seven list. 
So I need you right now to think about what are some of those really big changes going on that we need to pay attention to. I know we have some microphones that we can do or you can call out and I can repeat, but I see a, a friend in a green shirt. What, what's, what's our number one? Okay, so the, the point is technology. Technology is, is racing forward at breakneck speed. It's changing so much, and it has a, a negative uh, because it sometimes breaks down interpersonal relationships. It also means that we have the ability to access the Jewish tradition on our cell phones, on our iPads, and on our computers, which means that we can take out the step of having to go through the rabbi, the synagogue, the Hillel, and we can go directly to uh, the Jewish tradition. You got the entire Babylonian Talmud right here on my iPhone, <laughs> the entire Midrash, the entire Tanakh, the entire commentaries of Rashi, Ben Ezra, all here that I carry around. So when I have a deep question, in the old days, I would call up Richard Hecht. <laughs> I would call up Richard or any one of my mentors and say, help me through this. But today, a lot of people are saying, you know what? I, I can go directly. In fact, why do I need the organized Jewish community? I've got the organized Jewish community right here. So technology changes, opens up new realities, uh, perhaps redefines some of our key relationships. But if we don't understand the technology and figure out how to make it work for the strengthening of Jewish community, we will have missed a critical piece of this huge new puzzle. So technology number one. What, what else do we have? Yes? There's different permutations of what a family looks like now. So very different permutations of what a family looks like now, right? You know, um, can I just give you a, a example of that? So I'm walking down Broadway in Manhattan and I'm late for a meeting, and uh, I see the mitzvah tank from Chabad on the next corner. So I, I, I thought to myself, I'm in a hurry. If I go, he's going to stop me, and I'll be really late. Um, and I say, why don't I just cross the street, and I'll take a shortcut. And then I say, Rick, you're a Jewish leader. Go <laughs> talk to the nice people. Uh, I'm walking next to an African-American woman and an Asian man. The three of us are just having me walking along. And the Chabad rabbi somehow thinks his understanding of Jewish family means he should ask me if I am Jewish. He doesn't ask either of the two people walking, making an assumption that somehow I look like a member of the tribe. So the Chabad rabbi says, excuse me, are you Jewish? And I said, uh, yes, are you? <laughs> he, he's, a he's a little unnerved. <laughs> he's trying to think, maybe I should just let this one go. <laughs> and then he just, he can't speak, he just points to his seat seat, he points to his beard, he points to his black fedora. And I said, well, appearances are not always reality. <laughs> He's still standing on Broadway. <laughs> I tell you that because, the, to me, the presenting issue is he, he thought he knew who was part of the Jewish family. Um, you look a certain way, you have certain last names. That's not the Jewish family. It's not even family. And we have different configurations. We have blended families. We have single parent families. We have same sex couples who are creating beautiful Jewish families. The Jewish demography of who we are is so different than the stereotypical notion of who we were. That is a huge change. So technology, a changing reality of who we are as a Jewish community and who our families are radically challenge us. Good, so that's two. We got five more I need. Um, yes, right up front. The environmental awareness, that if Judaism is only busy talking about like the little stuff, we forget that the entire universe is, you know, potentially at risk. We, got, we need a global perspective. Great. So we got a third one. Great. What else I'm going to, you know, try and mix this up? Yes, in the back. Family feels relaxed and busy when they have time for something. 
Families, people feel too busy to make place for Judaism. I mean, temple for sure, but we're too busy. Is anybody here too busy? Yeah. We're, we're, we're like that. We're frenetic. We're, we're running, and our kids are even more so. So where, where, where are we going to carve out a place for the Jewish experience? Very powerful. Yes, right up front. I mean, just my colleague, uh, Rabbi Evan Goodman, who is my neighbor back in Westchester, now is at UCSB, so we're trading places. So it's a pleasure, a pleasure to see you and to know that Hillel and UCSB and this wonderful Santa Barbara community are going to be led by a couple of really, really wonderful rabbis, Steve and Evan. God bless. So you get a question and hopefully uh, some uh, wisdom you're going to share too. Thank you. Rick, um, extreme mobility, the fact that People change jobs, they change cities, they, they're moving all the time. Great. So part of that frenetic you know, quality is that we're also very mobile. We're, we're nomads, but in ways that we've never been, not even during the uh, Midbar back in you know, the, the Tanakh. So we're, we're moving, we're, we're, we're trying to recreate you know, connections, and we don't have all those roots and anchors. So what happens to our Jewish experience when we're literally uh, so fluid in our places and in our relationships and our experience of community. Great, great, great. Yes? In the American experience, everyone is a Jew by choice. And there has to be reasons that people realize the Jewish tradition is something for them to embrace. So this is, this is a really key point. The point is that we're all Jews by choice. So if we don't choose to be Jewish, it's not going to just be there. That to me was my own personal narrative. I was born Jewish, I was raised, went to Hebrew school, all those things. But until I chose to be Jewish, it, it didn't mean something. We're all in that boat, because you can choose not to be Jewish. That's a huge factor. That should change how we actually do all of our work, um, if we know that that is a reality. So I need just one or two more. Who thinks yes in the back, in the red? Finding a new way to reconnect with those nine brethren that you taught here. Yes, thank you to reconnect with those ninth graders that I taught here, are probably grandparents by now. Um, <laughs> but the youth, there's something happening right now in our culture that is literally uh, a reframe. And you know, if you think about 20s and 30s today, we're, and we're gonna think as a movement about all of the ways we interact with youth, uh, we need a complete reimagination of how we create, sustain, and nurture Jewish connection. It's just not that world. So last point here from my, uh, my friend from Men of Reform Judaism, a national part of the reform movement that has a, a strong and uh, a long position within our movement. And of course that, that brings up my point is the flight of men and boys from Reform Judaism. So actually the flight of men and boys from Reform Judaism. If you look actually the demographics, look around this shul next Friday night. And just do your own analytics and tell me what's your gender balance. First of all, thank God women have found their place in Jewish life, but it didn't mean that the men had to disappear. Um, we see that across Jewish life, and particularly with our youth, that uh, for Jewish boys to stay involved in Jewish life is particularly uh, challenging for us. So I'd like to actually do something with this information, and I was hoping that you'd get us to this place. So if we know that these things are going on, and by the way, a number of other things are going on, we need to adapt. Or what else? What will happen if we don't adapt? We die. Again, not to be dire, let's just be smart about it. So when I was uh, dating my wife, she worked for Mayor Ed Koch of New York. And the only way I could take her on a date was I had to go meet her at one of the events where she was staffing Ed Koch. So I heard Ed Koch a thousand times. <laughs> Every time Ed Koch spoke, he said to the group, any New Yorkers, what did Ed Koch always say? How am I doing? And can I tell you something? It depended on where he was, what the answer was. Sometimes people were thrilled, and some people were not so happy. So I want us as a Jewish community to ask how we're doing and to tell the truth, OK? The plain truth, the unvarnished truth. So can we just talk about Hebrew school for one moment? We are still to this day in Jewish life, the majority of our young people are coming into Jewish life through Hebrew school. Put your hand up if you loved Hebrew school. <laughs> Not one person. Put your hand up if your son or daughter loved Hebrew school. Okay, good. Put your hand up if your grandchildren love Hebrew school. So you see a progression there. Um, when I was a kid, my mom drove carpool to Hebrew school. 
And my mom was busy, she was working, so she didn't have a lot of time, so she didn't stop the car. <laughs> she pulled into Temple Beth Shalom in Santa Ana, California, uh, with our whole carpool, my friend Danny Ablanca, Norman Kachuk, this whole group of, uh, you know, uh, wild, crazy young boys. And she would slow down. <laughs> and then she'd kind of push us and say, what would she say? Go, go learn to be Jewish, and I'll be back in an hour and a half. <laughs> that, by the way, is what's going on still in the majority of our synagogues across the Reform, Conservative, Reconstruction movement. This old model that says you just drop them off like at a gas station, fill them up with Jewish gas, <laughs> and they'll be set for their life. But can I just tell you, um, to tell the truth about what the graduates of most of our programs know, um, pretty much we are creating a generation of functionally illiterate Jewish people. That's the truth. It's not a good truth. I know it's not true here at B'nai B'rith, but let me tell you, it's true at way too many synagogues across denominational lines. It is one of the truths we need to tell. So rather than drop our kids off, what if we actually parked the car, came in, learned? What if Judaism wasn't just for kids? What if it was for all of us, for us to deeply be nourished? Not occasionally to take a little, you know, kind of intro, but to dig deeply. What would be possible if we were able to do that? What would be possible if we were able to honestly say the truths that we know? So another truth that you may, you may know, and this is one of the harder ones, bar bat mitzvah. Right? For many of us, one of the most meaningful experiences with our families, it turns out that 80% of the young people who become bar bat mitzvah in the reform movement, 80% by the time they're 12th graders are gone. That's a truth that's hard to tell. It's a truth that demands a different way of thinking. Rabbi Jonathan Stein, who's the president of the CCAR, the Reform Rabbinical Association, stood at our biennial in Washington, D.C., and he said, I'm a rabbi of a congregation in Manhattan. I officiated 70 B'nai Mitzvah two years ago, and this year's confirmation class has seven students. He said, I say that not to tell you that I'm proud of that, but we've got to think differently about synagogues. So when we travel to foreign countries and people don't understand us, what do we do? We speak louder. We need to speak differently, friends. It's not that we just need to do the same thing with more intensity. We need to actually think differently about how we're going to engage the next generation of Jewish people who may choose not to be here. And one of the things that we're finding is some really powerful demographics. So there's a new category in Jewish life called nuns. I don't mean the kind that wear black and white habits. N-O-N-E-S. These are people who have no religious affiliation. They're across all religious lines. In 1958, 3% of Americans said we are nuns. We have no connection to religious uh, community and do not want it. In, 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 in 2008, that number goes from 3% to 17%. In the 20s and 30s that I mentioned a moment ago, the number is between 30 and 40%. These so are people who are staking out their lives outside of religious community. Now we could just say, well, I hope they come. I hope they join. I hope they participate. Or we can think differently about where do we actually engage them. So we're needing literally to think in different ways about addressing and finding the nuns. By the way, much of the Jewish world said, forget about them. Uh, I'm, I'm a nun. Uh, there may be some nuns here who came into Jewish life from the outside, from the periphery. I'm not willing to walk away from all those. Our reform movement says we need a big tent, and it's got to have a place for all those who are seeking and all those who are not yet seeking, but to build many, many doorways into Jewish life. So we actually have to think differently about who the Jewish community is, who's part of the Jewish family. Interfaith families are not incidental to the life of the Jewish people. Uh, they are potentially the backbone of where we're going. But that's a reframe. So Rep. Barry Schrag, who's the head of federation, we have our federation uh, leader here. Where, where's our head of federation? So Barry Schrag, your colleague in Boston, said to me a couple of weeks ago, he said, how ironic that the reform movement brought outreach to interfaith families, to Jewish life, and in Boston, I'm carrying the torch. He's a modern Orthodox Jew. 
He said he is shaping a different reality in Boston. So you know the national statistic is 30% of interfaith families raise their children in the Jewish tradition, 30%. However, in Boston, it's 60%. What is going on in Boston that it's 60%? Is it the Red Sox? <laughs> is it the food? Is it the climate? Does anyone know why in Boston they have literally doubled the percentage of Jewish children being raised in the Jewish faith in interfaith households? Do you, do you understand how that happened? It happened because they adapted because they said, we can make that happen. They built a partnership between federation and synagogues that makes the welcome and the open door and the open heart of that community alive in all of their congregations. They made a decision and they committed resources and uh, communal practice to engage interfaith families in Jewish life, and it works, doubling the numbers. Now, if you ask me, can that happen in every community in North America? It could, but it's not one of our many opportunities to think differently and to adapt, and not just to say, you know, gewalt. We're so good at that. Gewalt, oh, we have all these problems. What if we actually acted in a different way? So we have to think about all the concrete ways that we can engage the unaffiliated. And by the way, I hate the word unaffiliated. When we say unaffiliated, it means it's their fault. How about the uninspired? That's our fault. And I take that as our responsibility to figure out how do we inspire young people, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents to be connected and be involved. So we've got three major initiatives that we're using to try and kind of take advantage of this moment. We're, we're catalyzing congregational change. Synagogues need to become different places. They need to become more attuned at engaging people outside their walls and inside their walls simultaneously. When I was involved with Synagogue 2000, we went to Los Angeles and we called 50 synagogues with the same little script. We wanted to join, and we asked the person answering the phone how we would join. Can I tell you what happened? Who thinks we had warm, delicious conversations with 50 congress? We, we called up synagogues and they said, you want a what? <laughs> it's March, nobody joins in March. <laughs> Call us in August, phone hangs up. Really? You call up another person, oh, I'm sorry, the person who does uh, membership, uh, she's not here right now, call back next week. <laughs> on and on and on, 50 congregations. Here we were, we, the, the scenario was a young couple, we move to your neighborhood, we'd like to have information and potentially join, and the synagogue could not figure out how to get their arms like this. It sounds so unbelievably silly, doesn't it? You know, to learn the entire Babylonian Talmud, you know, two and a half million words, practice a little warmth. So I, I met your incoming president here at, uh, at CBB. Is Hallie here? She, Hallie. So I'm talking to her last night. What a phenomenal, what a phenomenal thing that this congregation is gonna have a bright, dynamic, energetic person to take the baton from all the people who preceded her. So she tells me the story. She and her husband came to a service the end of the summer no one knew they were coming. No one knew that she's going to be the next president down the road. And she walks to the outdoor sanctuary, and people run and greet with warmth and love. Can I tell you that is literally off the track? It doesn't happen. And a lot of us in synagogue life, we love our little circle, but we're not actually trying to expand the circle. So one of the key things we're doing is con congregational change to really deepen the way synagogues practice learning worship, uh, sacred community, Israel engagement, all the core areas of synagogue life. Our, our, our world here has to go from good to great, great to phenomenal, phenomenal to unbelievable. And we've got synagogues at all those different places. We're also expanding our reach. We're, we need to get outside the walls of the synagogue. The new rabbi of the 21st century is not going to be in his or her office most of the day. They gotta be out wherever people are, making connections, building bridges outside the walls, because you know what, people don't join synagogues the way they once did. Synagogues are not automatically gonna be on the, on the path of Jewish discovery, because why do I need to join a synagogue? 
Do I need to? to I can li get live streaming of Shabbat. I can find ways to learn. I can even celebrate Shabbat with my friends. So folks are not automatically going to join. We've got to build those bridges. And by the way, that happens person to person, whether it's a lay person or a rabbi or an educator or a cantor. We have to rebuild and reimagine. And if we don't get outside our walls, if we don't think of the Jewish community in its wider reality and only think of synagogues as buildings, uh, adapt or die. We're not likely to be there. We have to engage the next generation. Friends, what we know about the nuns that I spoke of is that they are not joiners. Robert Wuthnow of Princeton University wrote the definitive study about the uh, 20s and 30s across all religious lines, and he says, if they marry or partner, it's later than ever before. If they have families, it's later than ever before. And they are distrustful of all institutions, religious communities, near the top of the list. So those folks depend, obviously, on a new Jewish community to engage them. And can you just tell me what the future of the Jewish people is if we don't engage the next generation? It's, it's a link in the chain that just doesn't get forged, and everything that comes after is not there. So we're recommitting the way in which we do every aspect of youth engagement, from the way early childhood centers reach out and connect, all the way through reimagining bar and bat mitzvah, teens, college students, 20s, 30s, a whole web of sacred connection to build the kind of deep engagement that we need. By the way, Hillel's doing it very beautifully on the college campus. We just met with the entire senior leadership of Hillel this past Thursday in New York, and it turns out they're already doing this very work of engaging, not staying in the building, going out and finding wherever there are relationships and peer-to-peer -peer creating engagement, not sitting and having services in a building. We keep, we keep doing that, but we don't wait for them to come. We go out and find them, and we find them through networks and peers and all the different ways that we potentially were brought into Jewish life. So these are three core areas for us, catalyzing congregational change, expanding our reach, and engaging the next generation. And, and here I want to move to a statement about we've got to be part of something larger. I know I'm, I'm the incoming president of the Union for Reform Judaism. You expect me to be a partisan for Reform Judaism, and I am. But friends, if it's only about what happens in the Reform movement, we're done. If our kids don't feel part of the larger Jewish people, uh, it ain't going to work. And we have to adjust our self-concept. So let me give you a couple of frames. So a fifth grade girl in Riverdale, New York, decides she wants to have a bat mitzvah. Her parents don't belong to a synagogue, and her mother is not Jewish, her father is. And she says, I want to have a bat mitzvah. And they say to her, go find a place and you can have a bat mitzvah. They make her call. She calls all the synagogues in Riverdale, New York, Nobody's got time for her. Without joining the synagogue, without paying dues and tuition, they don't, they don't even want to finish the conversation. She calls an Orthodox synagogue, Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, and Rabbi Avi Weiss's synagogue has free Hebrew school for unaffiliated people and families. She goes for two full years, and then at the end of two years, everybody's getting their bar about mitzvah dates. They're not members, right? They're getting a great education. Rabbi Weiss makes an appointment with the girl to come into his office, and he says to her, I hear you're doing such beautiful work. I love your, your commitment and your generosity. There's one technical detail, however, that gets in the way of your having a bat mitzvah at our synagogue. Um, according to the halacha, according to Jewish law, you're not Jewish. And Tears start to stream down her face. She goes home, tells her parents. And by the way, Avi Weiss, prince of a man, said, I would be honored to help you through a process of conversion and to bring you in. Her parents said, this is nonsense. We'll go somewhere else. They called my synagogue in Westchester, and this girl and her family show up. I officiated the bar, the bat mitzvah, the bar mitzvah of her brother, and I did nothing to bring this family into Jewish life. Rabbi Avi Weiss, he did all the heavy lifting. Find me two reform synagogues in North America that care enough about the Jewish future that they build a bridge for people who are unaffiliated, uninspired to learn, to be a part. Now, maybe that's already happening here, but our responsibility isn't just inside the walls. The Jewish future is going to be 
but largely dependent on our engaging those outside the walls. So a second story. My daughter Sarah had her bat mitzvah two years ago, Baha Lo Tocha. Um, the local modern Orthodox rabbi of young Israel of Scarsdale is a, is a chaver, a close friend. So I invite him to come to my daughter's bat mitzvah on Shabbat morning. He says, I'll try. He gets up on Shabbat morning and says to a packed young Israel congregation, I have to leave now. He's right in the middle of, of davening. He says, I have to leave now. People said, are you okay? What's going on? He goes, I'm going to Westchester Reform Temple <laughs> because my friend's daughter is having her bat mitzvah. And, and he walks over to our synagogue and walks in. It's the first time he's ever been in a praying community where men and women are sitting together and women are leading prayer and reading Torah. It's a shock for this man. He sits in the second row, and one very active member of my synagogue got very indignant. And afterwards she said, yeah, I know he came, but he didn't open the prayer book. I said, do you know what it took for that man to walk into our synagogue? I said, I said to my congregation, I said, what is our equivalent gesture of being a part of something larger than ourselves. What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the reciprocal act for the traditional world to say, we're in this together? So I tell you those two stories that we are part of something larger. And I want to include as that part of larger is Klal Yisrael. And I know when I was here, there was a rabbi, Ben Venisti, who, who taught, uh, he was a very traditional rabbi, came and taught us on campus, opened up Jewish ideas to many of us. We're part of something larger, friends. We want a reform movement that is strong. I want a conservative movement that's strong. I want an orthodox movement that's strong. And I want a Jewish community that learns how to live with multiple pathways of authentic Jewish life. There's not simply one way to do this with passion and commitment and depth. And to do that, we have to change our self-definition. So the last big thing I want to say to you before we open up to lots of Q&A is our own self-definition of Reform Judaism. Do you know if you Google Reform Judaism and the word joke, you will be literally given thousands of jokes. And do you know who's the butt of almost every one of those jokes? The Reform Movement. There's that classic one. Do you know, do you know these jokes? You know them, right? They're, they're always demeaning, and they always assume there's not authenticity. So I would like us right now in this place to come up with clear, descriptive words for what Reformed Judaism is in its positive qualities. Not we don't do this, and we don't do that, and we don't wear this, and we don't wear that, and we don't keep that, we don't keep, I want us in only positive words, can we just right now come up with the key principles, values, and pillars that undergird this authentic expression of reform Judaism. Juan, give me the first one. We are a light unto the nations. We are the Jews who take Judaism up into the world. Okay, a light unto the nations, echoing the prophet Isaiah, that literally we have a, a mission, a purpose, to share the light of the Jewish tradition. Excellent. As a core from the Pittsburgh platform of the 19th century to today, one of the, the key pillars. People haven't had a chance to share. Yes. So there's something incredibly powerful about living in a, a, a dynamic conversation between the balance of tradition and the modern world, to come up with an expression of Jewish life that's real and alive in this moment. That is a powerful, powerful light into the nation, balancing tradition and modernity. Good. Give me some other key things. Yes. Acceptance and respect for other traditions. I'll call that inclusiveness, and, and uh, I will call that also a kind of uh, open, open-heartedness and a deep sense that there are more than one path. So we are the most inclusive in the Jewish community. By the way, if I'm on Broadway and the same three people are walking down, the African-American, the Asian, and the, you know, the tall guy with gray hair, I am actually not going to say to the guy in the middle, excuse me, are you Jewish? Um, Jewish people come in all different, all different uh, types, and uh, 
We are inclusive. Do you know that the first gay and lesbian synagogue in the world was embraced by our movement in 1974, Beit Chaim Chadashim, the first synagogue I spoke in as the president-elect of the reform movement. We are the most inclusive. Interfaith families are at home here and throughout our movement, inclusive in a most powerful way. Light unto the nations, uh, balanced tradition and modernity, and inclusive in the deepest sense. Key core values. Someone has a chance, yes, in the back. Growing, 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 beautiful, embracing. and embracing. So the idea that we want to grow our tradition as well as our, our numbers. We want to grow what it means to be a person of faith. The idea that this congregation could build an early childhood center in Rwanda as part of its core commitment, that tells us about the growth of what it means to open a homeless shelter in, in, in Brooklyn Heights, to build affordable housing in, uh, in, in Atlanta. Core ways for us to grow our numbers, but to grow our commitment. Serious Torah study, serious prayer, serious commitment, and life engaged with Israel. All key. What other positive? My friend Judy, who, um, who we honor as a part of our movement, and what a privilege to meet her today and to know of her connection to uh, Rabbi Eric Yaffe and to really our people all over the world. Beautiful. So Judy is a Holocaust survivor and says it's not because of the Holocaust, but because of our core work in this world to create a society based on justice and compassion and equality. That is a driving force of the Jewish tradition, of the prophets. It's not some additive from the political world. This is part of who we are. So when we declare that in a positive, that expresses a core of what we're about. And, and powerful to any generation that can live and experience that. Good. And any other, because this is really key, and by the way, we can't finish it today, but this is a good thing to keep doing in our community. Yes? Inquisitiveness. Inquisitiveness. That we actually think that you can learn from science and you can learn from history, you can learn all of the disciplines all help us to understand. So it's not only about, you know, learning the traditional texts but we are inquisitive to understand everything. Archaeology changes the way we understand. I had a chance to study the Dead Sea Scrolls with Richard Hecht. And you say, well, what do the Dead Sea Scrolls teach us about? They teach us actually about a diversity of Jewish life that once was incredibly alive in you know, antiquity. We are the movement that says that wherever you find truth and wisdom, you bring it to this discipline of shaping our lives. So a deep inquisitiveness in all of the forms, not just in, quote, the traditional categories. Rabbi Solweis came to the Notre Dame and spoke about the need to obey the need to disobey, and it kind of encapsulates that quality of inquisition on our people. Great. The, so Rabbi Solweis, who you know, who is one of the most remarkable teachers we have, the duty to obey and disobey. Uh, this coming, oh, oh, Actually, two weeks from today is the exact day that uh, Sally Prezan was ordained 40 years ago as the first woman rabbi. It was, it was not permitted. Uh, it was an act of religious disobedience to say the tradition needs to change. It needs to grow. It needs to become what it was meant to be. So that is a key part of reform. And that's a positive, not a negative, but we often say it in all these defensive ways, right? Uh, I'm not as Jewish as you. I'm not as religious as you. I don't do... Again, these are positives. Friends, we can, we're not going to finish the list. Keep making the list. 
And when someone asks you why you, and wherever you practice, by the way, my Orthodox friends, I want them to also have the positives about what, I, this is not just for the discipline. And by the way, if you ask me what's beautiful and powerful about Orthodox Judaism, I'll keep you here all afternoon. Let us appreciate that there are different pathways. And we work with everybody. The head of the OU called me up. He said, Rick, I want to take you out to dinner last month. I said, well, make sure it's a kosher place. <laughs> he said, it will, because that's what we do. We, we're the OU. Um, I said, I know. I was just making a little joke. Um, so it turns out, do you know what the OU is doing? He, he said, why don't we get our staffs together? The URJ staff and the OU staff could actually learn a lot. He said, we're doing all these programs in secular high schools, Jewish clubs, to try and engage the people outside the walls of Jewish life. Um, surprise. Steve Warnick, who's the head of the um, United Synagogue. Uh, Arnie Eisen, who's the head of the Jewish Theological Summit. These are all people we work together because we're caring and working for the Jewish future. If you tell me at the end of the day that the reform movement goes out of business, but the Jewish people exponentially grows in depth, commitment, engagement, um, that will be a good day. Okay? So we're not an end. The point is not to grow a movement so that we can be bigger, although we are the biggest. Big deal. I want to be the most committed. I want us to have the most serious learning, the most deep expression of social justice and of outreach and all the core values. That's worth fighting for. Whatever you name it, you go ahead and name it. But let's not do it on the backs of any other form of Judaism, because thank God we are living in a time of more Jewish creativity, more Jewish learning, and we should lift all of it up. And we should make sure that even when our kids find their place in a different Jewish movement, uh, let us be excited that they find their place in Jewish life. Uh, my name's Ellen Rady, and I briefly spoke with you earlier about it, but what is the URJ's idea about a current, present-day connection to Israel and how to engage our people with Israel? So I, I love the question, and um, it's, it's not a small piece of who I am and how I've spent my 30 years in congregational life. Uh, we, need, we need, first of all, more lovers of Israel. I think we, we've been, I think, mistaken to think that we need to create a bunch of lawyers for Israel. We need people who love Israel, and we need to grow that in deep, personal ways. By the way, to have my friends from the Leo Beck um, Educational Center here and the kind of twinning that you're doing, powerful, concrete. Uh, obviously, traveling back and forth, but Israel isn't just some mitzvah project. Israel is one of the greatest, you know, realities in Jewish life of all, of all of our history and we can be involved in a very deep relationship with Israel, uh, but we have to actually engage. It's not just going to be about sending a check. It's about sending our, our passions and about receiving. There's a, there's a renaissance going on. If you go to the Leo Beck School, how many people have been to Israel? Put your hand up if you have been to Israel. Phenomenal. Keep your hand up if you have been in any institution of the reform movement in Israel. Okay. So a big piece of it. One of the things that we need to do, by the way, is to relate deeply to the Israel movement for progressive Judaism, but the entirety of Israel is our responsibility. The land, the people, uh, the Sfardim, the Ashkenazim, the, the Ethiopians, the ones who love to celebrate Shabbat, the ones who you know, hate to celebrate, they're all part of our Jewish family. It's part of our responsibility. And we, by the way, could learn how to engage people outside the walls by learning from our Israeli rabbinic colleagues. I met the, the young Israeli rabbi in Ashdod. And uh, unlike the rabbi who comes to B'nai B'rith or Westchester Reformed Temple, they don't have a building, they don't have a congregation, they don't have an office, they don't have business cards, they don't have a computer. They just drop in the middle of Ashdod and say, make connection. How about that for a rabbinic skill? How many of my future colleagues are being trained to be able to be dropped into Isla Vista? <laughs> and they say, make Jewish connection. We could learn from the skills and the creativity and the, and the, and the wonderful strategies that are awakening Jewish life in Israel. And we have a responsibility to Israel's safety and well-being 100%, 100%. We also have a commitment to her core values 
to the sense of equality and pluralism. Israel and our lives are tied deeply through the heart, through our hands, and through our heads. And that has to be grown. So Israel is not going to just sort of be a graft on, but a deep part of what happens in synagogues. That's happening here. I can tell you, friends, it's not happening across our movement, but it will. And we're creating a whole Israel engagement faculty that will help congregations to deepen that day-to-day -day reality of what it means to live in relationship to our Jewish state and all of our brothers and sisters who live there. So that's a huge piece of what we need to do, and it's a huge opportunity. Good. So uh, it was shared that the March of the Living, which brings our, um, our young people to uh, Poland and then to Israel, and to link up with Israelis who do the same, a powerful expression. Um, let, let me just, if I could underline, you mentioned Birthright. Last week, Gibby Mark, who's the uh, CEO of Birthright, uh, was in our offices helping us to strategize what we do when our kids come back from Birthright. Does anybody have a rough idea of how many kids have gone on Birthright in the last uh, you know, decade and, and, and then some? Give me a rough number. 300,000, okay? Uh, it is arguably one of the most important things to happen in Jewish education ever. And where we're failing is when they come back. So a lot of those kids come back, they're charged, the spark is ignited, and they don't, they don't know where to go. So somebody called me up and said, I have the solution, what to do with the birthright kids. I said, talk to me, I wanna hear it. So it's very simple. They come back, we give them membership in synagogues. So I thought to myself, be nice, Rick. <laughs> I said, you know, I, I appreciate we have to do the right thing. I'm not sure that's exactly the right thing. I said, it, it may feel to me like giving my two boys, Aaron and David, free tickets to a Barry Manilow concert. <laughs> 20s and 30s don't often find their way to synagogues, and synagogues are not usually tuned in. So I said, could we, could we actually have a serious conversation about what to do? And so we're strategizing with the, uh, the rabbis. You have a new assistant rabbi coming starting this fall. One of the things that we've found out is when rabbis in communities go on the birthright trips, come back, and are the human catalyst to the next step, powerful things happen, and it's not just an experience, it then grows into something more. So we have lots to celebrate, and I would not want us to leave this morning saying, so what did Jacob say? Oh, he's so depressing. <laughs> there are all these problems, all these challenges. They are potentially all huge opportunities. A birthright, God bless, but frankly, we have, to, we have to leverage that into something more. How many kids do we just guess? Is it a regular part of Hillel at UCSB? Twice a year. Twice a year. And my guess is that we know what to do a little bit more when we take our own kids. But frankly, our kids are filling up all the other buses, and we have huge opportunities to think about new ways to engage the next generation, March of the Living, Nifty in Israel, EIE, the, um, the Eisendrath Exchange, but where kids go for a semester of high school. All these things are immersive experience. Our summer camps, we have 13 summer camps in the reform movement. 5% of our kids go, and those that go have their lives changed. Lori Gross is sitting in the back. We worked together at Camp Swig, changed our lives. 1976. I was there in my diapers. Um, <laughs> but camps have shaped the modern rabbinate for the reform movement. If you go to the first year class, say how many of you went to uh, URJ summer camps, you'll see uh, two thirds of the, of the students. It's the leadership core, but it's only 5%. God bless those who go. What about the Jewish day schools? We have reformed Jewish day schools. We have Nifty. We have all these different opportunities, but they're not put together in a coherent way. That's what we're working on. What's the next question? So the high cost of Jewish life, is that sort of uh, a familiar reality? So can I give you a really agitational idea? We have a seminar for incoming presidents of our URJ called the Scheidt Seminar. A hundred of our almost 900 congregations sent their incoming presidents. Hallie got a special one-on-one, -on -one, so I was able to do that. 
uh, right here. But it turns out we're going around the first night and I meet the president of the Cong Reformed Congregation in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Does anybody know that congregation? Good. It's a little shul. You know what they're doing around the high cost of Jewish life? I said, I said to him, I said, so what are you doing interesting in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania? He goes, well, uh, we did away with um, dues. Bury the lead. You did away with dues? Yeah, we have a completely voluntary dues system. People pay what they feel and what they can. They have to give an offering of their hearts, whatever it will be, and an offering of their hands, which is volunteer for the synagogue. And then I asked the, the key question, which all of the people on the board here would want me to ask. So are you making it? Are you getting enough money to fund the synagogue? Turns out they are not just keeping the same level, they've actually increased their revenue by turning to a different model. Now the high cost of Jewish life is uh, debilitating for many, many families who are very engaged. It also is the, the notion that dues may not be the way we define Judaism going forward for belonging. And I think when someone comes to join any synagogue, Shulweis' synagogue in, uh, in uh, Encino, Valley Beth Shalom, uh, this congregation, many other congregations, the first thing that many of us give is a long form and a schedule of payments. Uh, one of the things, can I just tell you, that Chabad knows better than we do, and there are many things they don't know better than we do, but on this, they are, are a teacher, is that relationship and, and Jewish meaning go first. Someone walks in, God bless when Hallie came running in to the end of uh, the summer services, the first thing that people need is something Jewishly meaningful and that someone makes a connection. Down the road you fill out the form, if you do. Down the road you write a check, if you do. But that's not the way it should begin. And too many uh, of our synagogues begin that way. So how did birthright happen? What do you pay to go on birthright? Zero. And how is it, is it free? No, people are paying for it, just not the people going on it. The state of Israel pays, federations pay, and a group of mega philanthropists have stepped up in a very big way. We have to figure out what are, the, what are the financial barriers to belonging to the Jewish community, whether it's a day school, a summer camp, a congregation, a trip to Israel. And, uh, and let's not assume that everybody in the Jewish community is doing so well that they can afford all of it. And those who can afford all of it aren't necessarily committed to putting their funds towards all that. So we, we should understand there are many barriers to Jewish involvement. And the financial piece of Jewish life, the expense, is a huge disincentive for many people. And synagogues need the funds, but we shouldn't make assumptions about what will bring us financial stability and what will not. I think some of our models need to be tested and we need new ways to understand those uh, possibilities. Yes? So a beautiful, a beautiful piece. By the way, the, the big tent in Judaism says that in that big tent, like my friend Jonathan Morgenstern coming to our synagogue who lives in the halakhic world and for him he had already davened um, to understand and also to make a place. So I know in my own synagogue in, in Westchester when we would um, talk about kashrut, he would say well kashrut's not a reformed Jewish commitment. But if you want your house to be a house for all our people, how do we do that? How do we create the sense of welcome? And how do we make space in our Jewish practice and life for those who are within the halachic framework, those who are not? And I think we need deep knowledge and deep understanding and respect. And in Reformed synagogues, can I just tell you, when my predecessor, Rabbi Eric Yaffe, became the president, almost all of the articles written were, will he wear a kippah? And on one level, I'm thinking, all the big questions in Jewish life, will he wear a kippah? So when I showed up at the biennial, I'm thinking, I don't want to read those articles. I don't think you want to read those articles. And are there more important things to talk about, whether Rabbi Jacobs wears a kippah and a talit and tefillin or not? And uh, I think we need a much more learned conversation and a much more respectful conversation about our own synagogues and our wider Jewish community. And halakha is one of the treasures of Jewish life. And by the way, Reformed Jews, uh, can engage deeply with halakha. You know, the idea that the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law, is somehow not our book, is short-sighted and simple-minded. 
it's all ours. Franz Rosenzweig said nothing Jewish was alien to him, but we've, in some ways as a movement, put aside a whole dimension that potentially is really, really key. So I appreciate your, your suggestion about what it will mean to be a larger klal, a larger sense of peoplehood. We actually have to learn how to negotiate some of those boundary points and how to, how to really, really practice pluralism, uh, not just our own partisan Judaism.